with that, Nathan Law, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. It's an honor to have you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nathan, an activist and a former parliamentarian from Hong Kong, uh, now living in exile in the UK. Thank you so much for the invitation from the Offset Union. And this is my second time actually uh, to appear uh, not in the chamber, but as a format of virtual event. And it's actually rather quite a strange time and we can only talk through internet. There is a sort of like lacking of connection uh, because we're not physically in the same chamber in the same space. But I think um, this is actually a very important uh, event and uh, the Hong Kong democratic movement is actually an important issue that worth every one of us uh, attention. And some latest development are indeed very worrying. On the upcoming Wednesday this week, Hong Kong's court will announce its ruling on the case of Hong Kong activist Joshua Wong, Anna Chow, and Ivan Lam. They are all my former colleagues who had been working closely with me for the past four years before I left the city. It is estimated that they may face at least one year prison sentence over their unauthorized assembly charges. Given the multiple charges they have, it is possible for them to stay in prison term after another, not to mention the possibility of more massive charges under the national security law. I, I left the city also because of this notorious national security law imposed directly by Beijing government and bypassed all local legislation and consultation processes. Now I'm allegedly on the wanted list under the law, which is maximum sentence is lifelong imprisonment. The implementation of national security law is seen as the last nail in the coffin of one country, two systems, the governing structure of Hong Kong that supposedly ensure Hong Kong enjoying a different political system than the one in mainland China to preserve its freedom and autonomy. The Joshua case may set a bad precedent as well since other prominent pro-democracy figures, including moderate politicians, Martin Lee and Margaret Ng, are also charged with the same offenses Joshua faced. By, lo by locking up a great mix of generations of political elites behind bars, Beijing attempts to silence the society's dissents. After decades of gradual erosion since the disqualification of election runners and lawmakers in 2016, China now launches its fresh attack on city's legislature. While the semi-democratic legislative council has long been viewed as the remaining pillars of Hong Kong's fragile autonomy, Beijing just imposed a decision that mandates direct expulsion of elected lawmakers without court scrutiny. Four pro-democracy legislators were removed thereafter. The new law grants Beijing more power over the city's legislature, as critical legislators can be easily outcast if they oppose the passage of controversial, controversial bills that Beijing leaders back. As a result, the remaining system of checks and balances is demolished. This qualification is not the end of political crackdowns. From parliament to prison, that is what Beijing aims. Several former legislators were also arrested over their protests against the controversial national anthem law. Slice by slice, Beijing now tightens its grip over the city without disguise. Authoritarian leaders are waging a cultural war in this fallen city too. In addition to restrictive measures, snitching culture is introduced to encourage people to snitch on each other. Solely on the first day that the new national security hotline, a snitching hotline, received more than 10,000 calls while the numbers reach above 10,000 after a week. Together with unchecked police forces and draconian laws, political informants become the new tool to monitor people's thoughts. To conquer the people's hearts and mind, the Beijing handpicked leader, Carrie Lam, just announced her new patriotic education plan to cultivate a sense of staunch and blind uh, patriotism among young students. Textbooks are also censored 
with sections on civil disobedience, Tiananmen student protests, and Beijing's meddling in one country, two system framework removed. Worst of all, Beijing's leader Zhang Xiaoming publicly called for judicial reform and urged putting patriotism at the heart of Hong Kong's system. In recent months, pro-Beijing newspaper publicly condemned the court ruling that contradicts their politics. The court ruled that the police failure to display their identification number violates the Bill of Rights. This judgment has been heavily criticized by state media and they are challenging the qualification of the judges. Beijing warns on judge, all judges to be patriotic and give rulings that the party likes. Worse still, Beijing loyalists are even calling for a sentencing council to supervise judges' decisions, which puts the territory's already weak judicial independence into question. Beyond any doubt, Beijing's intervention to local affairs will further undermine the city's rule of law. For a long time, the court has been regarded as a cornerstone against Beijing's onslaught and a key for international confidence in this Asian financial hub. However, when Beijing sinks its claws much more severely, the gradual demise of judicial independence in Hong Kong becomes inevitable. With the fall of the autonomy and rule of law in Hong Kong, the future of the city looks grim. After a year-long street protest, more than 10,000 people are arrested, and several hundreds of them are facing years of imprisonment. The suppression from Beijing never stops. While the world became more aware of its autocratic nature and its threat to democracy, it's time for the democracies around the world to stick together and to hold Chinese Communist Party accountable for their aggressive behaviors in their country and overseas. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so, so much for that opening address. So I want to start off very broadly. If you could start off by telling us about your career, where you started as an activist, what your experiences have looked like and how that's brought you to the position you're in now, just because I'm aware that we'll all have a different amount of background on exactly the work you've done and it would be a really useful starting point. Sorry, I didn't uh, properly introduce myself uh, at the beginning. No, 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 no. Address. <laughs> no um, yeah, um, that, that's a really good question because um, I, I gave a lot of speeches and I talked to a lot yeah. of people, um, mainly young people, because they are so curious uh, about youth activism. Like all the, all the attendees or all, all, all the people who are listening to, to this um, chat, this talk, may have something that they want to change. Um, they, they have, um, they have uh, witnessed um, social injustice or there are problems in the society, they are eager to change those things by participation. So I guess um, how a certain very ordinary and, and like a normal young, young, young person become um, uh. where am I is an intriguing question. And it is actually quite, quite abnormal for me to step into the path of politics. I, I was born in mainland China uh, and I moved to Hong Kong in 1999 when I was six. My father was actually a smuggler. Uh, he, he took a raft, very rough raft in the late seventies. And it took him two to three days to kind of like cross the border illegally from mainland China to Hong Kong in the pursuit of a better economic future and freedom. And this story always lays in my heart because I believe that Hong Kong is a land of freedom that people will escape from where they belong to and to this particular place. But that story, I, it wasn't told uh, to me when I was young mm -hmm. because I, I grew up in a blue color family. My, my father was a, stress, uh, a, a builder and my mother was a cleaner. So uh, politics has, had never came across in my mind because all we wanted is uh, stability, is, is, a, is, a, is a living basically, is, is they, uh, bread and butter issues. But not until when I uh, went to um, high school and my, my, my principal, which was actually quite pro Beijing one, uh, in the year two, uh, 2010, when, when she publicly denounced Liu Xiaobo, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize nominee, uh, on the morning assembly, it, it really triggers my curiosity because I thought that, oh, people who got no Nobel, Nobel Prize 
are the ones who are excellent in their field. So how come such an individual being criticized? And that kind of thing really uh, triggered me to explore what he's advocating. And I gradually understand more about social affairs, social justice, freedom, democracy. And I gradually stepped into the path of um, social movement. So in 2014, I became the, uh, the, the leader, student leader of the umbrella movement, which was a massive civil disobedience movement. And in 2016, I founded the Mosisto, a youth-led party, but now uh, was disbanded due to the national security law. And I was elected as the youngest legislator in the, his, in the, in the city's history at the age of 23. And one year after I was jailed because of my participation in the umbrella movement. And uh, time goes on and gradually become who, I, who am I now um, under such a difficult situation, um, being wanted by the Hong Kong government and being seen as the one of the most serious troublemakers by the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you so much. I'm afraid I'm going to ask another broad question to continue starting off. But how do you see your role as an activist? Like, what does being an activist mean to you? Well, I think being an activist is see um, bringing social changes as your vocation. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people asking me, like, how can I continue my activism? Or, well, does it make you feel um, hopeless witnessing uh, what has happened in Hong Kong. And for me, I, I, I indeed uh, am always in the middle of this political storm. Mm. I was legislators and I was outcast. I was jailed and now I have to live in a life of exile. But feeling hopeless never came across in my mind because I, I believe being an activist is not entitled to lose hope. Mm. Our mission is to find a place in it and a way to empower people, to let the people to believe that they can also bring changes. Mm -hmm. As an activist, is not someone who take all the responsibility and all the changes on their shoulder and, and bear all the crowns and, and fame and uh, aura. It, it's not like that. Uh, our biggest wish is to um, inspire and empower more people so that we are in solidarity and we um, kind of like promulgate uh, crowd movement, um, people's movement. So I guess this is my position and I've been really trying to view that um, through the expectation of myself, uh, no matter how difficult the situation is. And I gradually adopt uh, the increasingly difficult political climate and um, make choices that I could better contribute to the movement. Moving on then a little bit, I suppose, to the specifics of your experiences and to the situation in Hong Kong now. When the national security law was introduced, what made you decide that you simply had to leave, especially when so many people stayed behind? And what kind of relationship exists between activists who've left and activists who've stayed? Well, um, for Hong Kong's movement, that is a particular front mm -hmm. that people value, which is the international front line. We, we really hope that uh, by showcasing what's happening in Hong Kong, that we could get the support from the democratic movement, uh, democratic countries, and really tries to implement measures or redirecting their foreign policy in order to hold China accountable. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party is and has always been actually our enemy when you think about on the path of fighting for democracy and the human rights violation that they have been committing in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong. And um, by really putting pressure on them to holding them accountable and to tackle these human rights violations so that Hong Kong as a society and as a democratic movement, we can have certain leverage to really re overturn certain things. So I guess um, how to leverage on the international pressure to China and how to effectively communicate to other uh, polities about what's happening in Hong Kong and get some action done are actually very important uh, well, front line of the movement. So I, I have been engaging in that front line uh, for more than a year. I was studying at Yale University when the movement broke out mm -hmm. and I paid visits to uh, DC, to Capitol Hill and to talk about what's happening in Hong Kong and garnering their support. And strange enough, Hong Kong issue immediately became one of the very few, if not the only one, 
issues that both parties in the U.S. could agree on mm. in such a um, uh, uh, such a bipolar politics. So I guess um, this is something that I wish to accomplish in my role um, when I left Hong Kong because I think that we not only um, need people to resist on the ground, but we also have to broadcast our um, voice to be um, amplified on the international stage. So that's the reason why I left because uh, under the national security law, whenever you talk about other countries to put sanctions on uh, human rights violators or to hold China accountable in certain aspects, you are charged, you are under arrested and that the same same thing happened on me. I, I'm 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 being put on the list, so I guess that is the major impetus behind my move. Why I left Hong Kong. Do you think that's that kind of effort on the international stage has worked? Do you think that the international community is doing enough for the people of Hong Kong? Well, I think it had um, certain effects. Of course, mm-hmm. we cannot change um, the diplomatic policies of these giant countries in a glimpse especially when you think about how the bureaucratic system works it's a giant machine that if you have to get a slightly um change of its of direction mm-hmm. it's already difficult enough but we're talking about overturning its previous policy a very engagement and appeasement policy to china for over, for over te- decades it is not something you could ap- accomplish in months or mm-hmm. even in a year but i think we, we have gradually um gone more and more progress along the time. Just think about the situation in the UK. Um, at the beginning of this year, Huawei was deemed to be part of the 5G infrastructure. But half a year later, the decision was overturned. And uh, the British government is offering 3 million BNO holders in Hong Kong a pathway to citizenship in the UK and uplifting the um, extradition treaty with Hong Kong and implementing different measures to really uh, keep the state enterprise in the UK in scrutiny. Mm-hmm. And these are things that we couldn't have ever imagined like two to three years ago that the UK government will adopt. And actually the change of that climate is happening throughout Europe. We, we can see more European countries issuing stronger statements and making sure they have policies that could counter the current situation in Hong Kong and in China. So I guess my answer would be, a sense of becoming more assertive, adopting a more um, tough approach to China is consolidating. And that part in the US has already, it is already accomplished. Mm-hmm. And I'm really looking forward that my participation and actually my arrival in Europe could facilitate that change. Wonderful. Moving back more directly to Hong Kong then, as somebody who's worked both in on the ground direct action activism and somebody who's worked within legislative contexts, which have you found is, I suppose, more effective or which do you think is the way forward for activism in Hong Kong? We, we do need both. Um, mm-hmm. If there aren't some things happening in Hong Kong, uh, it's not something that will pop up into people's minds. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as there are protests, there are resistance movement in Hong Kong, so that it could grab people's attention and politicians will put it on their agenda. But on the other hand, if we don't have co- effective communication with uh, the politicians and NGOs and think tanks overseas in these critical countries and, and, and positions, then well, they may, have, they, they may miss something important in Hong Kong or they may not be able to put enough attention on it or they may not be able to come up with policy suggestions that could properly counter what's happening in Hong Kong. So I guess these two things actually um, uh, support each other and as a movement especially in a globalized world with heavy use of social technology uh, 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 social media technology mm-hmm. it is actually very important for us to combine every strategy and tactics and make it into a combination that works How did your experience of the 2019 protests then compare to your previous experiences, I think, especially in 2014? How are they similar? How are they different? What were those experiences like? Well, it's extremely different. Um, Mm. In in the 2019 uh, protest movement, we accommodate a motto of be water and leaderless. Uh, It's not a protest that with clear leadership or clear hierarchy, clear structure, 
but uh, it really demonstrates how uh, collective wisdom works, especially under the advanced technology that we could have a telegram group, we have a, a group chat, we have a forum that we could really brainstorm strategies and tactics and people with a specific talent, mm -hmm. which ordinarily they don't participate in social movement in a, a normal setting. But when something big happened, they will be uh, investing themselves into it, like software, software engineer, um, uh, uh, or even civil servants or some other occasions. And that kind of potential of changes and participation exploded throughout uh, the whole movement. So that is so different from the experience that I had, where mm. there are lead there, there are leaders in in the movement. People are looking up to them, and uh, we have a certain set of strategy and um, protocol that we follow. But in this movement, we can see like creativity and um, different uh, ways of conducting things. Do you think protest works better when it's leaderless then? Well, I think it, it really depends on the situation. In the situ mm. situation of Hong Kong, when you have uh, a suppression structure that the judiciary system, the prosecution, and um, the whole government is at the hand of, hands of this autocratic regime, mm -hmm. and they could deploy all the resources to target leaders. And if you have a very clear leadership, then they they clamp down on the leaders, then, then it will hamper the movement seriously and and these leaders they will suffer far much more consequences and uh, we don't have a really strong polit political participation culture so actually the current leaders they are they're not really far reaching enough to people to really consolidate their efforts but when it becomes to a leaderless movement uh people they they, they can have their own actions to have their own creativity and people who ordinarily not participating in social movement, they get involved and um, become more uh, creative. So I guess uh, it really depends uh, in the context of Hong Kong, I think that kind of leaders movement really suit the current political climate. Um, I wanna move on briefly then to the role of the press. Um, how has the role of the press, especially in Hong Kong, impacted what you've been able to do? Have you seen that change over your time, um, you know, working as an activist and your experiences in protest? Do you think that that's been central to your work? The, the exposure in media of Hong mm -hmm. Kong's movement is crucial. Um, seeing is believing and, and seeing is raising your awareness. Uh, only by having so many international press stationed in Hong Kong and reporting these major events um, 24-7 so that not only politicians but ordinary people they could really have a sense of what what what, what was happening in Hong Kong and infest their time and energy or even affection into that pursuit. So I think media indeed play a, a very important role especially they could amplify our voices dig deep into the truth when the government want to hide it. Uh, but I think in that situation will gradually change because for Hong Kong now, the government has been implementing more and more measures to restrict uh, press. And under the influence of the national security law, a lot of international media started to worry whether they are journalists are safe because whenever they kind of like report something sensitive, they could be charged or prosecuted. And in fact, there are plenty of um, international uh, journalists are being denied visa. Uh, this is the first signal of the, that cramping down or increased control over the media industry. So actually there are lots of international journalists that are worrying and some important agencies are moving their headquarter, Asian headquarter out of Hong Kong uh, in response to the national security law. Do you think then that the future for non-pro Beijing Hong Kong press, I'm thinking things like Apple Daily, do you think that their future is essentially dark and that they won't be able to maintain their independence? Well, it would definitely be dark, um, even though we, the people, supported this media. Uh, the, the Apple Daily is massive. Uh, they, they, mm -hmm. they sell more newspapers uh, than the others when Jimmy Lai, its founder, was arrested by the police. And uh, we've got a, a huge uh, online readership on uh, some of these pro press freedom and pro democracy news outlets. But the problem is the government's suppression. Um, is, is not 
a fantasy for them to really arrest journalists based on what they report in the future when the political climate mm -hmm. um, is worsening. So I guess uh, people will still support them, but if they fail to sustain, that would be uh, the reason of political suppression. All right. We'll ask one final question from me then before we move on to audience questions, because quite a lot are coming through. But I honestly would just like to know finally your views on what you think the future of Hong Kong looks like. Do you expect to be able to go back anywhere in the near future? Do you expect that, you know, democracy will be able to make some sort of return? Or do you think that essentially it's on a downward path? Well, as I said, uh, the future of the city looks grim, at least the near future. So I don't think I would be able to go back to Hong Kong in decades time. Really? It will take a long path for Hong Kong to achieve democracy and freedom, but it will eventually be there. As an activist, I, that is my belief. That's my faith. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think for now, uh, I, I think the situation in China really um, shaped the dynamics. And I think they, is facing, they, they are facing a lot of domestic and international problems which will weaken them in the future and they will need to resort to other sorts of legitimacy other than mm -hmm. patriotism and economic gains and by then there will be changes no one knows what the change will look like but definitely when there are changes in uh, there are crisis in china then it could be a uh, opportunity for hong kong Great, thank you so much. We'll move on to audience questions then because we've got quite a lot coming in. The first one is an anonymous one which says, do you think the resignation of pro-democracy lawmakers from LegCo was a good decision? Well, I think it's a, a, a bitter decision, but it's necessary. Uh, we've been criticizing the lack of democracy in the legislature for a very long period of time. For now, half of the seats are through direct election, but in the other half of that, most of the seats are reserved to the probation camp. Mm -hmm. So even though for every time the pro-democracy camp wins a majority mm -hmm. in the general election, we are always minority in the chamber. And with the recent outcast of the four legislators, the people in the legislature have the feeling that if whenever I say something that the government doesn't like, I'm going to be expelled. So what's the meaning of me staying here as like a window dressing of uh, the parliament and um, well, meanwhile, people's voice of uh, really board contamination is so high. I think that that question really uh, tickles them. And, and I, I believe that is definitely a, a very, uh, you don't really have many choices. That kind of choice is a very bitter decision, but I'm in support of them. And I hope that it will, it will stir discussion on, on, on the international level and really recognizing Hong Kong's freedom is fading away again. Thank you. Um, the next one is also anonymous, but I'm going to read it in full. It says, as a Hong Kong citizen born and raised in the city that we all adore, I just wanted to express my greatest appreciation and gratefulness for all your sacrifices. May I ask for your advice for our young generations? Would you recommend us to stay in Hong Kong and attempt to maintain the autonomy and continuity of our way of life? Or would you take a more bleak view of urging us to promote our views abroad? Uh, I actually think that I'm in in no position to make that comment. It is your life. You are attached to the place. You have relationship with people around you. You like the food, you like the language, you like the sentiments. And it's a big decision. Um, I don't know much about you and the other young people. Um, and I hope you take that question seriously. It's only you that could figure out whether you could contribute more in the movement on the ground or overseas and I hope that either of that decision doesn't make you feel bad because that is after your contemplation and with your utmost effort to figure out which is the right path so I guess um well you are the one who can only make the choice and I can only wish you good luck Thank you. Um, the next question is from Jacob at Maudlin, who says, how can people from other companies, be com companies, countries, best support the Hong Kong democratic movement? I think, of course, um, voicing out for them, really, when, whenever your, your, your representations are doing something good for Hong Kong, you support them. I think this is crucial. I've actually received a lot of um, warmth and support 
in the UK for the past five months, a lot of people they have. Uh, I think uh, it really caught me off guard. Uh, I met a lot of people that they have different kinds of relationship with Hong Kong that I I could have imagined. Like for some, they was born in Hong Kong, they worked in Hong Kong, they still have families in Hong Kong, and um, the time of the time Hong Kong faded in their memory for quite a long period of time is like a dusty word for them. Mm. But when they reappear on the newspaper, it, it revitalized, and it it, it gives them extra emotional affection into the course and paying extra uh, attention to, to what's happening. And it really fascinates me. And that kind of energy really translate to the influence to backbenchers, to parliamentarians, that they are much more active engaging in Hong Kong affairs when they could see their constituents having that feeling and taking and demanding to take action. So I guess um, the best way is to get involved in your political circle, get them mobilized and uh, supporting the right policies and right, right course for Hong Kong. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Rufus at Pembroke, who says, how impactful was Hong Kong's unofficial national anthem, Glory to Hong Kong, and what does it mean to you? How effective is group singing flash mobs demonstrations such as the World Cup qualifier match and in shopping malls last year to the overall movement? To assess how impactful it is, yeah. um, it's, it's simple to see how government treats it. The government issued a statement days after the implementation of the national security law says that glory to Hong Kong is official event. It's so absurd, like from a point of view from a democratic country that the government is saying that certain songs, certain slogan is illegal and they are being very blunt and blatant saying that we are censoring everyone's political freedom. We are censoring your freedom of speech and we are prosecuting you by your political speech. And you could really see how impactful actually these songs are uh, when the government responds in that way. Actually, I, I still have a goosebump, goosebump up uh, when I listen to the song because it really, really connects you to all the sufferings and, and all the resistance that you have had and you experienced with your fellows for the past year. And it's actually a very strong material for the building of our identity. It's just like you're listening to, the, to, to your national anthem. So I guess it's really powerful. And that's actually um, in, in a process of like nation building or, or building a imagined community that these artifacts, these, these arts play a really crucial role. And the same thing happens to some kind of like flash mob demonstration. And it is also a, 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 a material like uh, for, for the construction of our um, community, of our identity. Actually coming off of that, what is it that Hong Kong identity means to you and how does that factor into the work that you do? I think it, it's difficult to really outline the contour of, of the identity because it, mm. it means so many different things to many people. But I guess that kind of like witnessing the suffering of Hong Kong people for the, for the past year, the pursuit of democracy and freedom really glue us together. Maybe for some, they, they value on the experience they grow in Hong Kong is naturally their home, home, hometown. For some, they, they treasure in cultural terms. They love Cantonese, they love Canton pop song. Mm -hmm. um, they write the characters that are different from men in China. Like the term Hong Kong means different things from uh, for, for, for different people. Mm -hmm. but I think uh, that the most my fundamental thing is the pursuit of freedom and uh, expelling that kind of like authoritarian influence from mainland China. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Lydia, who says, how do you discuss your politics from your parents if they're still in Hong Kong? How do you factor in their safety when making decisions as an activist? Honestly, I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. I understand how difficult it is. Uh, uh, as I told you, the backgrounds of my parents. And um, at first I didn't tell my mother I was participating. Like in 2014, when I was elected as the head of our student union in university, and um, I didn't tell her, I didn't tell her that I went to protest. I didn't tell her I was arrested, mm. but not until one day when I was on the stage 
and was holding a mic and the police raid to the stage and um, arrest me, handcuff me in front of thousands of people. My mother was in a wedding boutique, drinking, chatting with her friends. And then she looked up into the television and she, he, she saw my face. And that was the moment she recognized that I was doing something that she doesn't want me to do. And um, it took me a long while not to convince them that I'm right, they're wrong. It, is not going to work, but to convince them that they're not going to change me. I'm not going to leave right, really severely confront them or yell at them. I just demonstrate by actions, showing them that, okay, I understand your point, but I'm not going to change. The only thing you could do is try to understand me and possibly supporting me. So throughout the years, it, it, it's been, it took me several years for me to really get her on my back and to share all the things happening in the movement to her. And now she is a staunch supporter. Um, she has been supporting me for quite a few years, even though she has been worrying for me. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I'm no longer able to communicate with her because after I left, I issued a statement cutting ties with my families because that is the best way to protect them. If you look at the implementation of the national security law in mainland China, for example, a human rights lawyer arrested, detained, jailed, but their families, the, the, the wives, the, the children are also under intimidation, surveillance. They cannot leave the country or for some, they cannot go to school. And you can see that kind of like political crime in, in, in mainland China is not about yourself, but about everyone around, around you and, and they could be endangered because of your activism. So I guess, at that period of time that I, I need to make a decision that at best interest of my family. So I guess that's how I've been through so many changes and um, difficulties. Thank you. Um, the next question is another anonymous one, but it says, do you think it's important or possible to gain support from ordinary people in mainland China? It's difficult. Um, w even though we, we see Chinese Communist Party's behaviors are outrageous, but we have to recognize that it's the most sophisticated country mm. who has um, digital surveillance, um, uh, media control, um, propaganda. These, they are the best in the world. The firewall and the way that they spread their own version of truth, which normally it isn't achieved successfully. So for now, I think it's still difficult for us to penetrate mm. the information, no matter from the Hong Kong protester side or from the Western liberal camp sites. But at the end of the day, if they have an um, explosion of anger and dissatisfaction domestically, then they will have more intention to break that of censoring and that, um, that firewall and to seek different things, seek different opinion from the ones from the Chinese Communist Party. So I guess the, the triggering point would definitely be for them, for the people in mainland China, that they face crisis, they face problems, they face uprising, and they want to seek information other than the one they are fed by the Chinese Communist Party. And, yeah. and that would be the point that we could penetrate that firewall unlikely we are having now but i think in the in few years time then they will have a major crisis and and there will be chances that we could penetrate that sophisticated firewall thank you um the next question is from ben and esther who say do you think you'll be more or less effective in the uk given that you'll have to form new networks and mobilize the british public who aren't quite as personally invested in what's happening thousands of miles away i think it's difficult but that difficulty is exactly the reason why I'm here. Mm. Um, in the US, the consensus for building up a stronger uh, China policy is very mature, is all accomplished. Um, bills about Hong Kong are getting, part, are getting passed in an incredible speed in Congress and being signed by the president. Mm -hmm. So when I was... Uh, Last year when I was at Yale and when I was doing all this lobbying work, 
we could indeed see that like incredible speed and incredible consensus among uh, these political parties. Mm -hmm. But the same thing haven't really reached in the UK and in Europe. And I think that my position would definitely be going to somewhere which is uh, difficult to do something, but there are more room to grow and it's more strategically important to be honest. When uh, the US uh, really review their decoupling strategy or position China as a serious threat to their um, mm -hmm. global order, to, to, the, to their national security, it's Europe as a great zone that China wants to grasp. They wanted to infiltrate into it, getting support from the European leaders and trying to make it as a balance to the so-called US hegemony yeah. or US uh, unilateralism. So Europe well, suddenly became a battlefield, a battleground. And I think that is actually that difficulty draws me here and try to build up a stronger alliance to combat that authoritarian expansion from China. Thank you. We have time for just a couple more audience questions. So the next one is anonymous, another anonymous one, excuse me, who says, how do you view the more violent styles of protests that have occurred during, for instance, on the mainlanders that were captured and beaten in Hong Kong airport? Well, that was definitely very um, unfortunate. And, and I've commented on several occasions, I do not agree on that mm. actions. Um, and you, you could really see violence emerged gradually um, throughout the movement. At first, it was mostly peaceful. And uh, you could see the million people rally, the two million people rally. They did it um, uh, in such an organized fashion and very peacefully. But I guess in terms of addressing those um, violence clashes, we have to understand the root cause of that. The root cause would definitely be when police officers, they have been deploying um, unpro unproportional violence, unproportional force, beating up protesters, arresting them arbitrarily, or even allegedly torturing and sexually abusing them. Actually, none of them are under any kinds of investigation or being held accountable. More than 10,000 protesters are arrested, but none of the police officers, even though a police officers being filmed shooting into a barehanded protester on their chest with real bullets, they are not in any forms of investigation. So that kind of intentional, intentionally that brutal ways of dealing with protesters really agitated them, really infuriate the whole situation Mm -hmm. And that's why violence emerged because they only they think that that's the only way to protect them. Professor King once said, "Riot is the voice of the unheard." Mm -hmm. um, even though we do not frame that as riot, but I think the meaning pretty much really close to what had happened. So I guess um, cherry picking incidents is it, so simple. Mm -hmm. You could really, no matter in the civil um, uh, the, the civil protest in the 60s in the US or some other movement like Gandhi ones, Man Mandela ones, there are violence. There are always violent wings of, of these movements. There are always incidents that may endanger people that they may not want to endanger. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the trajectory and look at how things evolved into that fashion, you'll all realize that the ones who should be held accountable are not, and that is the root why people coming out to risk their life, risk imprisonment for years, and just to voice out. Great, thank you. We have time for just, I think, about two more. So the next one is another anonymous one, which says, do you have any solidarity with the Ogre people? And if so, how is this expressed? Yes, definitely. Um, two of the most visible human rights violation in mainland China now are the Hong Kong and the uh, Xinjiang, the Uyghurs concentration camp. And this is widely discussed and I'm in solidarity with them. And I hope that officials who are responsible for those violations should be sanctioned. And for example, solidarity campaign for boycotting um, the big companies using the forced labor there. I was supporting them and I'm aligned with them. 
So I guess this is an important course that we all have to pay attention to. Thank you. And then final question, it's another anonymous one, I'm afraid, which is, do you worry about the politicization for support for Hong Kong in the UK and the US? Do you worry that it's becoming a partisan issue rather than something that should be supported by everyone? Well, I guess um, there are always a partisan side of that because people have judgment, well, whether the Democratic Party or um, uh, the Republican Party mm -hmm. or in UK's context, the Labour Party or the uh, Tories, which one of them are more supportive for Hong Kong, to Hong Kong people? And that is definitely people's judgment. So there are discussion and, mm -hmm. and, and inclination from certain group of people. But I don't think that would evolve to a level that this issue being seen as a partisan issue. Um, because if you take a look at the president-elect Biden's um, Twitter, Twitter statement, like they, I, I, I've counted it. Mm -hmm. um, he tweeted eight times to, in support of Hong Kong during the movement. And even though he's more like multilateral, um, more relying on current global order guy, but it's obvious that during his interview and um, his staffers interview, they have a drastically different strategy compared to four years ago. So I guess um, in, in, in my position, um, my role is to cooperate with whoever wanted to express their support mm -hmm. and who are able to express their support to Hong Kong movement. I've been in contact with um, Republican staff and congressmen and also the um, um, Democratic Party. I've met with uh, Nissan Andy, the, the shadow foreign minister, mm -hmm. and also uh, some government officials, um, Nigel Adams, uh, in uh, the government in Asia affairs. Mm -hmm. um, I think th these are important build up and, and you have to be seen as part of a gradual um, bipartisan issue rather than you are collapsing on, on one end. So I think, I, I, I don't think um, that Hong Kong issue is being seen as partisan. And I hope that like those discussion of who benefits more if they were elected is actually quite healthy. All right. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, but thank you so, so much to everyone who attended and who asked questions. And above all, thank you so, so much, Nathan Law, for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute honour to welcome you once again, and we're so grateful for all of your insights. Thanks so much. <laughs>